Uh, my name is Brendan Powell. Um, I'm an ex-jockey, ex-trainer, and I'm now racing assistant to Joseph O'Brien. Yeah, well, I was born in um, uh, Kill. Uh, there's a place there called Palmerstown. There used to be a stud, and my father was ma was manager there. And uh, I suppose we just rode ponies from the from the day I was born, really. Um, uh, myself and my two brothers, we had one pony between us, and they gave up riding, and I continued it. And I went to school in Kill, um, and then probably when I was nine years of age, we moved down to Mallow to a place called the Waterloo Stud. So my father managed that, and um, I suppose I took up riding more seriously there, and but did a lot of hunting more than anything else. We had one pony; he wasn't very good at show jumping or that, but he was a, he was a good hunter. So I'd hunt twice a week with the Duhallas. And Mrs. Nelson, that actually owned the stud, she was the master of the hunt. So um, I used to get three days hunting, which was great. Um, and then I suppose when I was sort of 12 or 13, I'd never ridden a racehorse. And my dad was given a horse called Buddy Overstreet. And he had actually won the Irish Lincoln on the flat and never jumped an obstacle till he was, I think he was about 10 or 11 when we were given him. And he'd never jumped anything in his life. And... I started school in him and I rode him actually at List Carl in his first point of, in my first point of point when I was fourteen. Because in those days you could get a license of fourteen. So I had two rides in him and I think he ran away with me from mile and a half in each of them and fell in a heap. So um yeah, that's basically where I started and got the got the got the love of racing. My dad rode a little little bit, had a few rides and then he was travelling ahead lad to old Darky Prendergast. So um he was there probably the same time as Kevin Prendergast. Now they were they were best friends, so my dad would have been roughly he'd be a few, couple of years younger than Kevin, but I think my dad was um was a sort of a, an apprentice, but rode a bit on the flat and a bit over jumps, never rode a winner, but um, he became travelling head lad to Kevin Prendergast, or to Paddy Prendergast, yeah. When I when I was leaving school, my father sent me up to um, I remember him driving me up to. Limerick and uh, he drove me into this place down this drive and it was a massive big house and there was this man called P.P. P. Hogan who I'd heard of him as a as a point to point trainer because I sort of had the two rides in point to points or something and I remember God this bloke and so anyway my father left me there and I was there for uh, it was four or five months and um, I literally never I never left the place I lived in the big house but he used to, I used to have to go upstairs through this bedroom and then was in a, a little room in the loft at the top. There was only a little bed in there. And actually there was no electricity in it. And I used to have a methylated spirits light at night time. <coughs> and um, had a little transistor radio. So I spent four months there with him, but I learned a hell of a lot. And uh, I think Roger Hurley, rest him, he was there at the time and uh uh john fowler was riding from and then um in the bulger and just before i left i remember niall madden uh, boots madden he started riding a lot of them at the time but with some seriously good horses there like underway any crack so they were they were like serious horses in the day but he was one tough man pp my god he wouldn't let you ride out in the winter with gloves on and sure i was only a kid at the time and he um but like the school and I did there over the banks and all that sort of stuff, which, but something like that just, I think set me off as, as probably more of a horseman than a jockey and, um, learned a hell of a lot. And I remember sort of a few times wanting to, I said to him, oh, can I go home for the weekend? No, you can't. So, and then he wouldn't let me ring, ring me mother and father from the house. And so he just kept me there working for, I think it was four or five months. And then, I got a fall one morning schooling in the snow over a stone wall and uh, I broke my collarbone and I remember in, he said to me, you haven't broken your collarbone and I just couldn't lift my arm and I think I passed out in the afternoon and anyway, he took me to the hospital, I'd done the collarbone so it was my way of getting out of the place, you know, so I, I went home then for a while and because the first night I arrived there and I remember I sort of, um, like I said, I, yeah, your dinner is ready at six o'clock so like I just came down into this massive big kitchen and the table was like twice as long as a snooker table. 
and he was sat down that end and then Susan his daughter um, was cooking dinner and uh, I sort of walked in he just he used to call me Mallow Man because we lived in Mallow at the time never called me Brendan always called me Mallow Man and he just looked up and he went through the glasses and he went sit there so there was one chair at the other end of the table and I remember sitting down and thinking what do I do now and anyway Susan came and sort of put a meal down in front of me and then PP's in front of him and then she left the room and uh, I sort of sat there and he started eating and he looked at me are you not hungry and I went I haven't got a knife and fork Mr Hogan and he went your hands were made before knives and forks boy and I was thinking what's he on about he goes use your hands use your fingers so I remember eating this and I'll never forget it was bacon and cabbage and I remember eating it eating this with my fingers thinking this is this is not right but that's the way it was that was that's just what he was like I got one the next day but that was that's how he the first time he started me off and I'm thinking this is this is going to be a tough one and by god it was but there we are I learned a hell of a lot well then I um I used to go and uh, get on my bike every Saturday morning I'd cycle I it was about 10 miles to a, a guy called Cornelius O'Keefe and um I used to go there and ride out as a kid, all, all, all weathers, it didn't matter. And he was a good point to point trainer and had a few under rules. And he actually gave me my first ride in a bumper at Limerick. And I rode there. Um, and then when I was 15, um, I wasn't great at school and didn't attend very often. So my dad sent me up to the Curra to a guy called Michael Dilger. And Michael worked at the National Stud and um, he trained trained about 10 or 11 horses for um, Jerry Newman at the time was uh, one of our top jump jockeys and his father had horses with Jerry uh, with Michael because Michael was married to Jerry's sister so he'd do a couple of lots in the morning and then he'd go off to the National Stud and do his work and then I'd ride the rest of them out for the day and it's amazing I was, I was probably only 15 or 16 at the time so I do them for the rest of the day. He come back in the evening, and uh, we do them between us. So I was at the I was at the on the car. I'd say for about uh, seven or eight months, and then I was in digs there. And there was a phone call one night, and the lady that owned the digs came and said, "Your dad's on the phone." And it was a Thursday or Friday, and my dad said to me, "He said, oh, uh, you're going to England on Monday.'" and when you'd never been sort of out of Cork or Kildare, I hardly knew where England was. So I literally just got uh, shoved onto a plane and uh, landed at Heathrow Airport with a small bag. And I was picked up by a guy who I'd never heard of. And it uh, uh, turns out to be Brian Smart, who now trains in England. And he drove me up to Lambourne uh, to work for a woman called Mrs Pittman, who nobody had heard of because she'd just started training at the time stuck into a caravan in the middle of a field there and said to be in work first thing in the morning. So that was my uh, introduction to the UK. Well, well, Mrs P at the time, she um, she had trained quite a few point-to-point -point winners and she hadn't had many uh, runners under rules in those at that time. And I'd say she probably only had about eight or ten horses. And Brian was sort of first jockey and he was... Uh, sort of head lad and doing everything but Mrs P used to sort of make her living out of breaking in a lot of horses for Paul Cole so um, anyway I was there with, with Mrs P for 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 a year and she got bigger and bigger and I remember coming back for the summer and I think I'd, I'd had one ride for her and I came back to Ireland I actually missed Ireland a lot so I came back and um, I just said I wasn't going to go back over and then she rang my dad and said look yeah send him back so there was no persuasion in that time it was basically told you go back to England so I did and I sort of took over as second head lad it was probably when I was I was probably only about 17 at the time and the yard got bigger and that year was great we had um, she had some lovely horses and she had a treble one day and then she won the Massey Ferguson with Bueshiro um but then she had horses like um Gillipus and uh he, he he would have won the Welsh National and he fell. And then basically the yard got bigger and bigger. Um 
then Colby Air came along. I was there at the time. I used to ride him most of the times. He won his couple of bumpers. And I think the following year then I left because I'd had a few rides for her and fair play. She gave me a ride in the Kim Muir at Cheltenham um, on a horse called Alpenstock, which he fell. And I'd probably only had about 12 or 14 rides at the time. And uh, I was probably famous at that time for bringing down Prince Charles because he rode his horse in the in the, in the the Kim Muir that year and I fell down the back and brought him down. So two of us came back in the ambulance together. So that, that was uh, that was quite fun. So, um, but yeah, I stayed at Mrs P then for another year and then I left after that. I sort of, I, I got, I, I got the bug of I wanted a race ride, but I was absolutely useless to be honest. I wasn't very good, and uh, sort of everybody had said you'd never make a jockey, but I was determined to. So I thought I'd go to a different yard, which I did. I suppose when I when I was young, like Franken was the one that we looked up to, and he was because he was in Lambourne as well, and everybody in Lambourne in those days, like Jenny Pittman, Fred Winter, Fook Warwin, did all school on the same day on a Thursday, so. I, I like in those days at the beginning I'd be riding the horses up there for the jockeys to get on you see and I wouldn't be you know it was a big thing if you schooled a horse so I remember like going up there and th like canting up with on a, on a horse thinking god I hope I see John Frankham up there and uh, but no one he'd be stood there out of school for Fred Winter so then you'd see him or then you'd go down to the village and you'd see him driving through the village in his in those days, they'd just be Porsche and that, you know, thinking. And then he ended up becoming a, 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 a friend, you know what I mean? And I rode against him and sort of... And actually, the last race that he rode in was at Chepstow. And it was like the Welsh champion chase they had at the time. And um, the two of us were upside in the straight. He was on a horse called The Reject. And I was on, I was on um, uh, Mr Moonraker that day. And uh, next thing, he fell upside me and I saw him getting dragged along. And I won it, and he came back in, and he just chucked his stuff down. He went, I said, boys, I'm off. You can do as you like with that. And I remember nicking a pair of goggles off, off his de off his bench. You know what I mean, sir? And he he said he said he said that bastard up there is telling me something. He said, because two weeks, I think it was like two or three two or three weeks before, he rode the same horse at Cheltenham, and he fell and he got dragged, and he got dragged again on him at Chepstow, and he just went, now nah, that's it. And John, like John was John was quite a young man when he retired, you know. He was he was unbelievable over a fence. He was just like he was just poetry in motion. He he did the show jumping first, and I'd say John would admit himself he wouldn't have been, you know, if you look at some of the lads now and finishes and that he was he was different then. But he was just, but he was so strong. He he didn't have to sit on his ass and and sort of murder a horse with a stick or anything. But he just did it. He just did it with his legs and his body movement, you know. Dunwoody was the same. You know, if you watched the two of them in the finish, they were just they were just strong and they just got the best out of every horse. And, but I'd say Dunwoody was probably the most dedicated that I ever saw riding as regards planning races, how they'd run, his own fitness. Um, and he was... He was just, in that sense of it, he was just completely and utterly one track towards it. And so I went on to David Gandolfo's and he was, David was quite good at giving um, conditionals rides. And at the time he had the top conditional in the UK called Mark Richards working for him. So I went over to David's and oh, I was there for, I was there for, uh, I'd say two seasons with him and Look, there was no agents running at that time, but they used to, um, a lot of trainers would ring up the yard looking for Mark to ride. And then David's uh, wife at the time, um, she'd sort of stick me in for rides. So I picked up a few off, off Mark as a result of that. And then um, I think I was, I saw I had my first rides at 14 and rode my first winner at 21. So it, it took that long. And... Um, it was a horse called Button Boy at Windsor for a man called Martin, uh, for Nick Ayliffe. And he won a two and a half handicap chase. I've still got the video actually somewhere, but it's on a, on a tape, but it's, it's in black and white. So um, I think it looks like slow motion as well. Either that, we were going very slow, but no, Windsor was my first winner. Um, I rode three winners that year. Second winner was a horse called Blue Braves at uh, Taunton for um, Bernard Scriven. So, um, 
yeah, I sort of started getting the bug then. Um, I turned professional when I went to David Gandolfo's. Um, and then after about two years there, maybe two and a half, um, I got a couple of spare rides for Stan Miller. And um, my rides were drying up a little bit for David. Um, he, didn't have, he didn't have that many horses and Paul Barton and Mark Richards were riding them. And, um, so I got a couple of rides for Stan Miller, whose yard at the time was growing, was a big yard. And he said to me one day at Ludlow, he said, um, he said, would you ever think of, of moving yards? And at the time I probably was thinking about it. And he said, well, look, he said, I'm quite prepared to give you a chance. So um, anyway, I left Davis and I went over to Stan's and I ate some great horses there at the time, like Pollard's Town and Saxon Farm and, you know, real good horses. Um, so I went, to, I went to him and got quite a few rides for him. And... Philip Blacker was there at the time, Steve Jobar, so real good jockeys. So um, so I stayed there for about three years and then lucky enough I started picking up some you know, some some um some decent rides. Um and I think the second year I had eleven winners or something. And then it was some like twenty one. So yeah, it just started getting going then. But it was it was still slow and you say twenty one winners was in those days was an unbelievable season, but um I still felt as I just started to lose my claim, um, I sort of got down to five, just started struggling a wee bit for about a year then. I mean, John Franken was, um, was probably, was, was, was the tops at the time, and myself and Richard Dunwoody, we started together, we were, we were best friends, we went everywhere together, went racing together, um, even to the point sometimes he was an amateur, I wasn't earning a lot of money because the trainers took half of everything in those times. And I remember I bought an old Renault 4 car and Dunwoody didn't have a car, so the two of us go racing. And I mean, the day he rode four winners at Hereford uh, as an amateur, which really brought him on the scene. I'll never forget going there that day. And we actually, we didn't, we didn't have enough money to actually pay for the fuel there and back between us. And um, I remember we, I, I borrowed, we borrowed a tenner off the valet just to get us home. But, you know, it's... Um, it was it, it, it was it was weird times, but at the time you never thought much about it. And um, I, I mean, just going back to that, I remember as an amateur, sort of ringing up people for rides all the time. And um, but in those days, it was go to a phone box with a with a horse and training. And um, the only time you'd really hope to get rides was on a bank holiday, because now they'll have four or five meetings on a bank holiday. Those days they'll have about twelve or thirteen. So a lot of the meetings, literally, you could ring up and say you were Joe Soap and people to give you rides because they, there was just no jockeys available. Yeah, you know, have you ridden a horse? Yeah, okay, ride it. So that's what we did. And I mean, I remember driving to Fakenham once and I had a, a Morris 1100, but every every half an hour on the road, I had to fill the radiator up with water because it kept overheating. You couldn't afford to, um, to, to uh, get it repaired. So I remember taking two big drums of water in the back and driving to Fakenham, which... Even now from Lambourne would take you a good three and a half to four hours with motorways. And um, I remember it took me about eight hours to get there and arrive in about 20 minutes before the race just for one ride in an amateur race, you know. So, um, but hey, look, they're, I think they're, they're things that made you stronger in life. Well, I think the major breakthrough for me was I was at Stan's <clears throat> and you had to ride out for Stan every day, but he'd give you one, one more in a week to, um, to go ride out for somebody else. So I go to a couple of just sort of the permit holders that I was riding for the time, Bernard Scriven and Nick Ayliffe and people like that. And there was one day, um, uh, there was a guy asked me to go on school for him and um, up near Worcester. So I went to school this horse for him and I schooled it. And on the way back, there was, um, there was a meeting at Worcester that day. And I remember I'd rang up, there was about 24 runners in a, a conditional jockey's handicap chase at uh, Worcester because there were a lot more runners in those days and I rang every single trainer up and um, they all had somebody or other and the first two races I watched those and then I thought I'd just stay and watch the boys race and then get back for even stables and there was a pile up at the ditch down the back and there was about five or six fallers and next thing there was an announcement on the loudspeaker if there was a conditional jockey without a ride in the boys' race, would they um, go to the weigh room immediately? So, of course, I ran in the door 
and I met Johnny Williams, who at the time was Johnny, a uh, little Welsh man with a stutter, and he, but he rode over jumps and on the flat, and uh, so Johnny was stood there, and um, I just went to the clock of scales and said, "You're looking for a jockey," and Johnny sort of knew of me but didn't really know me, and he said. Um, uh, he said, ha, 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 have, you, have you got a ride? And I said, no, I said, I haven't, John. And he said, oh, um, ride one for Les Kennard. Now, at the time, Les Kennard was, um, I always said he was the sort of Martin Pipe of old because if you rode for Les Kennard, you'd get hundreds of rides a year and loads of winners. He didn't have many horses, probably only about 45, 50 at the most, but he'd run horses week in, week out, brilliant trainer. And um, anyway, this... I came out with a saddle, I borrowed boots off everybody. And the thing was, I was very sort of skinny at the time and had big feet. So I had somebody's boots on size nines and the boots were hanging off my legs. So I had elastic bands around them and I must have looked a complete amateur at the time because I didn't have any gear there. And uh, this big man stood outside and, and I said, oh, I, I rang you for this ride. And he went, um, oh, well, I hope you're good, he goes. And uh, anyway, because his jockey got hurt earlier, uh, Les Bloomfield. So anyway, I went out and rode this horse called Fitzherbert. And I walked into the paddock and he, in those days, horses with bad wind that could run with a tube in them. So he had a tube in his neck. And uh, he just said to me, um, I like my horses handy. Uh, jump them out, be handy. And uh, he said, I think he'll win. And nobody sort of said that to me before. Anyway, lo and behold, uh, he did go and win. And um, I beat a horse of Fred Winters, Neil Fern Road, I'll never forget it. And then I walked back in and sort of Les was saying, oh, you're a brilliant jockey, you're a brilliant jockey. And he said, come to the bar after and meet the owner. So I went in, got changed, went back out to the bar and Next thing, Les goes to me and he said, where are you riding tomorrow? And I was thinking, I don't know where I'm riding for the next year, let alone tomorrow. And uh, I said, oh, I have no rides tomorrow. And he said, go to Ludlow. He said, I've got four runners there, you can ride them. In those days, you didn't have to book the jockeys 48 or 24 hours. You know, a lot of the days you see the daily paper and there was no jockeys down. And um, anyway, so I rode these four from, I rode them another winner, a couple of seconds. And basically I just started riding Les's from then on. And uh, but then people always said to me, and I, and I knew it myself, that Les was, he brought along so many young lads over the years and he loved claiming jockeys, so he'd claim it. And they said to me, the other jockey said, look, as soon as you get down to three pound or, or lose your claim, he'll finish you. So I was thinking, well, you've got to take this chance. So anyway, I started riding all of Les's and um, look, he's, he's some good horses at the time, a horse called Mr. Moonraker. You know, he ran in the Arkle. Um, Scoo beat me ahead in the um, embassy final at Ascot on him. But he'd some good horses and he'd Saffron Lord, another one. And then sort of towards, you know, I lost my claim then and I just thought that's it. And Les stuck by me till the day he retired. And um, I think he's, the last good horse he has was Panto Prince. And he bought Panto as a companion out of the Ascot sales for 200 quid or something. And he'd no pedigree and kept him till he was three, broke him in. He was tough on his horses, but by God, they were sound and they loved to make the run and they jumped and they were very fit. And I rode a lot of winners for Les and some nice winners. And um, he, everybody said the same thing. He was hard on his jockeys and I never had one fall out with him in, I think five years riding for him. And then he, um, the only thing that did upset me a bit was that at, at the end of the last season, he was training, but nobody knew he was going to pack up. And I started riding a few for John Edwards. And um, he was sort of getting horses to like a pearly man and um, yeah, just some, some real good horses. And I started riding a few for, for John. And he was up to, I'd say, 100 odd horses at the time. And he offered me the job. So I thought I'd go and speak to Les. And Les said, look, you know, I've looked after you. And I just thought, no, I'd be, because I've always said to even my son and my daughter, just be loyal to people who have looked after you. And um, anyway, sort of I turned it down and John wasn't very pleased about turning down. It was, it was a great job, you know, but um, so I said I'd stick with Les. And then the last day of the season, in those days he used to finish the last day of May and begin on the 1st of August. And I had three rides for 
Les at Stratford on the last day. And I won on the first two, which was um, Saffron Lord and Fitzherbert, believe it or not, who I had my first ride from. Um, and this was five years later. And as soon as I got off Fitzherbert, I walked into the winner's enclosure and then I heard an announcement saying, and congratulations to Les Kennard, uh, who's just trained his last runner. And I really fell over with a heart attack. And um, so I... Uh, so anyway, he retired that day and just announced it literally on the day. But look, that was it. I was I was starting to get sort of connections with loads of different sort of smaller yards and that at the time. So um, look, you just you, you you pick yourself up and and then Les Les thought the best way of um, of sort of getting round me was he said, oh well, he said I'm taking three horses to Jersey in two weeks' time. He said you can come and ride them. So they were his last three runners in Jersey. So I went there and. Uh, no, that was it. But I had a great time at Les, and um, yeah, he was he was he was a, a tough man, but he had tough horses, and and uh, uh, look, that that got me going from that spare ride that day at Worcester. He was in a place called West Bagborough, the other side of Taunton, and he literally didn't. He never had a gallop. He literally just trained on the on the Quantocks on the hills and the mountains through fields, and the horses were sound and they were tough and. You know, they just they'd go, and because in, in those days you'd you'd actually ride beginning of the season. The ground was officially hard because there's no watering system, so you go down to Exeter. It was like a, as brown as this this floor here, and it was concrete. And um, you know, you still get you you get more runners than there are at the moment on the water ground, but his horses were sound as pound, and uh, they were fit, and um, so that's where he trained. And then uh, when he packed up, Chris Popham took over there. And he started training um, the likes of Panto Prince and that then until he retired. And so I started riding all Chris's after that. But that yard's shut down now. I think there's a small housing estate on it. Les died, oh, I'd say, about 12 years ago. So um, so his, 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 his wife, Jenny, she's still down in, in the main house, you know. But um, no, Les is a good man. As I always say I was in the right place at the right time. If I hadn't gone to school that day for Tony Layton in... Um, in uh, in Worcester, um, just on a, on a horse he wanted to claim off. He was a decent horse. I can't think of his name, but he was a, he was a good handicap hurdler. And if I hadn't gone up there to school that that day, I'd never got to Worcester. So it was, and then as I said, the pile up down the back where Les Bloomfield, who was riding Les at the time, he got the fall, and broke his collarbone, and then just from there on, I just took over. But yeah, you know, there's no agents, no mobile phones, so you you know you just. In those days, most of the yards, like Fred Winter, Fook Warm and all those, um, you know, Jenny Pittman's, those people, you know, they had their jockeys, you know, like at Fred Winter's, there was John Frankham, Richard Pittman, and then the, the, the sort of younger jockeys like um, um, uh, sort of Malcolm Bastard, um, you know, people like that. Uh, Paddy O'Brien and they rode the horses in that yard. There was no outside rides. It's easy for the jockeys, I think. Now they 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 work they work bloody hard and they're fitter than we ever were. Um, but I'd say, um, you know, in those days you had to, I suppose, the travelling and all was they they still travel. You know, I see Brendan there and you know all the lads over there. You see the likes of Sean Bone and one day they're up in Perth and the next day they're down in Fontwell and what have you. So. But I think they're, it's made easier for them, I think, with agents nowadays. You know, they, they put the work into it, but as regards getting the rides. But I suppose we <coughs> we had the sort of three-week entry system before over there. So everything was entered for three weeks before. So you'd get the racing calendar, you see the entries. and But horses would be entered sort of multiple times. And trainers had fair idea then where, where they were going to run them in a few weeks' time. Said spare rides were they were just impossible and I suppose that's when I was when I when I was starting as an amateur or as a conditional if you didn't have a ride for your trainer you were literally ringing up you know you, you'd you'd look at a card at the at the sort of they, they used to put the entries in before um the bank holiday sort of seven days before so literally you'd look down them and you start at the bottom with the 10 stoners and work up you wouldn't do it the other way, you know, because all the, all the top ones were all the big trainers and then the smaller trainers were the ones at the bottom. And I was very lucky, even up to the day I retired, I was, um, I never had a weight problem. So, um, you know, I was always able to do 10 stone my whole life. Easy. So I started running a bit for Elsie and then um, 
because uh, because I think it was it was uh how was it uh eighty nine or something that um Les packed up so I started riding a lot for Elsie, and at the time, Graham Bradley and Simon Sherwood were riding quite a few as well. But there was enough horses to go around, and um, and Colin Brown was still there, so I was um yeah and of course Desi and Barnbrook and then when when um uh when Dunwoody or when Dunwoody pack or when uh, Simon Sherwood packed up, um I ended up getting the ride on. Uh, Barnbrook again and I thought I was going to ride Desi and then Elsie said to me one day he said look he said the two of these are going to meet in the King George and he said I don't want to have to put a jockey on on uh, on one of them on the day of the King George now I knew I knew in my heart and soul that um, Barnbrook again wouldn't get the trip in a horse box let alone anything else so Elsie, it was more or less a thing of tossing a coin to see which who got it myself or Dunwoody. So anyway, Dunwoody got the got the ride on him, and um, which was which was fine. Uh, I still had I still had Barney to ride, so um, I won a couple on him. He was a, he, he he was a serious horse. Broke the track record with twelve seven one day in Newbury, and um, actually it was it was Sprinter Sacre that beat it five six years ago, whatever. And um, so Richard rode Desi, um, and then the two of them met in the King George that year, and uh, Desi won it. I think that was his second or third time winning it, and I, I, yeah, he won it, and I finished second on Barnbrook. Actually, nursed him around basically to try and finish second, which I did. But the owner at the time, Mel Davis, wasn't a uh, rest him now, but he he wasn't very happy with the ride I gave it. Um, even though Elsie trained the two of them, Elsie was delighted, and basically Barney didn't get a yard over two and a half. But I nursed him around to be second. Um, anyway, Mel wasn't happy, so when I came in, I said to him, "I said this will win the champion chase for you," and he went, "He will." He said, "But you won't be riding him," so he dropped me off. <laughs> so, um, anyway, he did. He ended up winning the champion chase that year with Hugh Davis on. But I'll still say to this day, I don't think I'd have won them because Hugh was brilliant. And uh, he lifted him home to to beat uh, Waterloo Boy, so I wouldn't have been as strong as Hugh. So um, I keep saying I didn't really miss the champion chase with her, but uh, I was sick at the time. So then I, I say I was starting to ride a good bit for for uh, Elsie, and uh, anyway he got Ryman Reason, who basically had lost his form for a year or so with David Murray Smith, and he'd won the Irish National the year before, but lost his form completely. And I remember he, um, you know, at that, that time I still wasn't, I wasn't actually connected to, I wasn't first jockey to Elsie at the time because he was using so many different people. And I remember him asking me to ride Ryman Reason at Lingfield in a handicap chase. And I remember looking at his form and thinking, geez, that's got no chance. So anyway, I turned him down and went somewhere else. And um, I remember uh, Ryman Reason finished second or third with Colin Brown on. And then the next time Ryman Reason ran again, Elsie asked me to ride him, and uh, I think it was a wing canter. And there again, I thought, geez, got no chance. So I went somewhere else, had a load of rides, turned him down again. So, um, yeah, I just thought he was a horse who basically his, his best was gone, you know. And then he asked me to ride him in the Welsh National. And I said, yeah, I'll ride him in the Welsh National. And um, anyway, Two days, the day before the Welsh National, I broke my collarbone. Uh, so I broke my collarbone on the Boxing Day. So the Welsh National came and I watched him running there and he jumped the last upside in front and finished second. Ross Arnott rode him. Actually, Paul Nichols beat him. And uh, he rode, I think it was, was it Broadheath or something. So I, um, so anyway, I thought, well, that's it. I'll never, get, I'll never get on him again. And lo and behold, when I came back then, Elsie asked me to ride him in the... Uh, the big chase at uh, Sandown in January time so I rode him there and uh, he actually he, Desi Oak had ran the same race and uh, and I finished second to Desi so I sort of got the ride on him there and then he ran in the Fairlawn chase at uh, Windsor which had, which was a, a, a decent sort of gold cup type of prep race and he won that um, and then I rode him in the racing post chase he won that um and then he went for the gold cup 
And I still say to this day, Charter Party one, I still say that I was actually travelling that well coming down the hill that he over jumped and slipped and landed. And I still say the way he used to finish his races, I still say he'd have won it. And um, so Elsie said to me, he said, I'll run him in the, if the owner lets me, I'll run him in the national. Now, Juliet was like just passionate about her horses, Juliet Reed and uh, John Morton, they owned him. And she didn't want to run in the national, but Elsie got his way and he ran. And um, I think if you look, it was it was only something like 12 days or something after he fell in the Gold Cup. And people talk now about running horses quickly. But like from Christmas time till till he ran in the national, as I said, he'd ran, he'd ran in the, the Welsh national, uh, the Fairlawn Chase, the Racing Post Chase, the Gold Cup, and second at Sandown to Desert Orchid. And this is like only in April, the, the, the 6th of April, and then he runs in a, in a national and he wins it. And um, I know his favourite or second favourite, but like his jumping, you know, he, I mean, nowadays he'd probably get lapped because the speed they go and the quick, how quick they take the fences on now. But he was just one of those, he, he was so careful, he'd just go in the bottom and he'd just climb over fences. Beecher's first time, I sort of, um, Elsie just told me to keep him wide and to drop him in. And he's all she couldn't hit the front of him, but he was never, he was never quick enough to lay up over any sort of pace. And early in the race, he, he carried his head very high. He was never on the bridle. So, um, and not the biggest horse in the world. So he'd always, he was quite difficult early on. It took him a long time to warm up in a race. So I was just potting down over the first five in the national. And um, I was down the outside and he got to Beecher's. And he actually jumped the fence okay, but because he when he when he jumped, he sort of people used to say it was in my hands that did it. But even when he didn't have any contact with his mouth, he sort of always jump with his head in the air. And of course, he 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 sort of lifted his head in the air, jumping beaches. Lucky enough, I hadn't gone middle to winner, but there wasn't that much of a as big a drop on the outside. But he actually just um, he uh, he sort of landed, and next thing I knew was he was sort of gone. He was sat down like a dog. And um, lucky enough, for some reason, I just if he did turn left or right, I'd have probably fallen off him. But lucky enough, he stayed underneath me. <clears throat> and there's some great pictures of him. So the way he was sat down, it was great because at the time he was sort of tailed off last, and I just thought for a while should I pull him up, but he just kept potting away around and potting around, and then sort of going down the back for the last time, he got into the race, and. Um, I moved into second after jumping the canal turn second time. And Little Pulvier was eight or ten lengths in front of me with Tom Morgan on. And I thought, well, you know, I can't hit the front on this till as late as possible, so I'll just sit second. And it was a fair way off him. Next thing, Tom goes and falls off. Well, I say he made a bad mistake and came off Little Pulvier, which left me in front. And um, I'll never forget the time Tom Taff, uh, Chris Grant and... Um, Don Woody were up behind me, and I could hear Don Woody shout at them, "Don't go past him; that'll pull up in front." Just tell you, Don Woody's brain was working, and they left me in front, and I turned into the straight, and I thought, "Elsie's going to, he's going to kill me if this if this gets beat," and um, he was the second last. He tried to refuse it, and next thing, Granty came past me, and um, I thought, "Oh well, that's me beat," but when he jumped the last, my God, he f he found some turn of foot, and. Um, went away so he was uh he was um he was some little horse and to think actually when he when he made that mistake at beach his first time he actually broke his hock and um yeah he felt okay in the race but he pulled up after the race he was fine he walked in okay then an hour after he was hopping lame and then he had to go and have surgery and have three pieces of bone taken out of his hock so just tell you what a tough horse he was never ran after that retired to Juliet's uh, stud farm down in Newbury, and he's buried there now, yeah. I think horses ran more in those days than they do now. Um, I think that nowadays people protect them probably more than they, they did before. Um, yeah, look, they looked after them great, but horses were there to run. And I suppose I wrote for trainers who ran their horses, and, you know, Les Kennard, I mean, if a horse, if a horse had 10 days off from a run before, you'd ask him, is there something wrong with it? You know, you just sort of, they just run them and um, I mean going back to Panto Prince I mean as a three year old and I mean he was by a horse called a Panto I don't think he ever had another winner and just no breeding to him whatsoever but as a juvenile from three to four years should never run as a three year old but he ran 18 times 
and he won two and he was placed in most of the others and Les just ran them and ran them and ran them and didn't abuse them but ran them they were fit and well and they went the whole season through I think I think Elsie's horses I mean Elsie had lots of first time out winners and he was he was just he was just a brilliant trainer of any horse and but his horses the jump horses would never do much more than the flat horses and I remember used to think at the time <coughs> I suppose coming from from Les's who Les was very very tough on his horses but um I remember thinking Elsie doesn't do an awful lot with these, but even though he had a lot of, you know, those three mile chases, and I mean, he'd like go far and horses like that, the one at Hennessy, and you know, he's some he's some serious horses, but you know, even his even his from Dead Certain and In the Groove and those sort of horses on the flat Indian Ridge, you know, from a sprinter to anything, he trained them all the same, yeah, yeah. But I just think that people they they ran them more in those days. I do feel as well that. Um, like the, you know, the likes of the likes of Desert Orchids and Hustler. Like if you see how many times they ran the season, but you know, Elsie, you know, people go, oh well, I suppose you know nowadays they go, I suppose your next one now is the King George and that, and Elsie'd like take it to Wing Canton in between and let them carry twelve stone seven and go and win, and you know that's what they were doing. You know, they they just they just took horses from, you know, one week to another, yeah. and and they ran them and they were tough and hard. Uh, look, I, I won the Toke Gold Trophy on uh, James Mead for Elsie. Uh, Mick Shannon owned him, and uh, I think they pulled off a fair old touch on the day on him, and uh, he was very good. Look, Panto was great to me. He 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 won some good races, but I think the best horse I ever sat on was a horse called um, Sir Blake, and Elsie trained him. He was owned by Juliet, and the the year I won the national, the 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 last race on that day used to be the big novice hurdle believe it or not and uh, it was the first time I'd ever sat in him he'd won his three novices he fell at the last at Cheltenham in the in the Sun Alliance when he was clear he would have won and uh, I beat a, a good horse called Blazing Walker I beat him 15 lengths on the bridle that day at entry and he was a machine um, he came out the next year he won his first three chases in a hack canter at Newbury uh, then the big race at Kempton and then at Ascot, and then I think he was odds on for the the Sun Alliance chase, which is the RSA now. And about ten days before, he broke his leg on the gallop. And um, but Elsie always said he was probably the only horse he ever had that was probably better than Desi. He was an absolute machine of horse, and um, I think he was only beaten twice in his life. I think, and in one of those he fell, but he was he was just sheer class to sit on. He could have won over two mile or three mile and. He just big chestnut horse, and he was, he was a, he was an aeroplane. Uh, not by people who knew me, no. Um, I suppose you got a bit of TV coverage, and you, you know, do the cover. I mean, I came back over here. I got flown back to do the late late show, which was great, with Gay Byrne, and yeah, just a few shows like that. But yeah, at the end of the day, you you went out riding the following day, and that was it. And I think I went to Fontwell the next day and got dragged down the hill by one of the novice chase for Robin Dickens. So, it's um. Look, you're you're just you're just back to, you're back to doing your job again. Um, I I sort of never let things like that get to me. I just love riding and, um, yeah, it's good. I probably got a few more rides for a little bit after it. Um, I look, I was just look, I was very lucky. I, I I rode for some great people, you know, right up to the day I retired and just met some unbelievable people in the game. You know, it was just under seven hundred. Um, I rode quite a few abroad. I was I was. We we used to get the two months off in the summer, uh, June and July, so you'd have a week's holidays or ten days holiday, and um, but because I was light, I was always sort of quite, I was quite popular to go abroad and ride a fair bit, and um, I used to go to Norway and Sweden a hell of a lot, um, Germany, uh, with Jersey I loved it. I used to go there sort of every meeting through the summer, um, and I was probably. Probably one of the yeah, I went to America and Australia. Rode a couple of winners there, and I suppose the one of the biggest ones was I. I was the first jockey outside of a Japanese jockey to ever ride a winner over jumps in Japan. Believe it or not, um, and that was just before I retired. I got invited over there with um, David Casey, um, who's with Willie, and we went over there to ride in two races and a, a sort of a thing and and mile, the mile and a half chases. And I won one of those, and it was just, 
it was just we were there for a week and it was just some experience out of stores mile and a half her chase and it was just on rock hard ground but like unbelievable horses he was a group winner on the flatter road and it was his first time actually to jump any you know apart from school in the home but you know that was some thrill and i think at the time it was worth like 70 grand to the winner which i missed the I missed the winner of the Scottish National um, on uh, for, for David Nicholson, Moorcroft Boy, I was supposed to ride him. And uh, I was over in Japan at the time and it was worth like double what the Scottish National was. So um, so I did that for three years in a row. I went over there and I enjoyed that. And then, as I say, when I went to Australia, um, I rode a winner for, um, for Colin Hayes, who was the name at the time. Dermot Weld used to give me a good few rides at um, at Galway. and uh, always came back to riding Galway. Um, Eddie O'Grady rode a few for him. Um, and Tony Redmond gave me my first Punchtown Festival winner. I won the big two-mile chase there on a horse called Flying Ferret, which, God rest him, Anthony Powell stuck me in for. Um, he only had 9.7, so he couldn't do the weight and put me in for I was able to do 9.7, believe it or not. And... Um, so I did that, and um, I rode a, then I rode a, Bob Buckler used to bring horses over to Punchstown every year and won the Pat Taff chase for him on um, Miss Diskin. And then I was lucky enough, my third season training, and I actually trained the winner at Punchstown, and Ruby rode that for me. So um, I won, won the big three mile novice hurdle there in a bog. So um, yeah, I used to. And I, I brought a couple of flat horses over here, and they've got the big, the big sprint at uh, the Curra on Oaks Day, and um, I had a good little horse at the time. Uh, geez, I can't think of his name anyway. And uh, Liam Keneally rode him, and Billy Lee claiming seven came up and chinned me on the line by a nose. So I was lucky with injuries for a long time, and then I brought my femur twice in a year, and um, then the bones always mended. Look, I broke collarbones, wrists, arms. The usual, and uh, but then I at entry, um, at entry, uh, probably in the in the nineties, had a bad fall at entry one day, and um, I ruptured my spleen and my stomach, and um, I sort of had had a lot of internal bleeding that day, and that that was quite. I was sort of out of it for a bit, uh, but came back from that, and that was good, and then I suppose the. The last fall that finished my career was at Newton Abbott, and um, I was one of Bob Buckler's, and, and actually I just got unseated off at the first, but the horse behind literally just caught me and fell on top of me, and um, I think that was on a Monday, and I woke up 10 days later in Torbay Hospital, not knowing what had been going on, but I'd, I'd literally crushed the rib cage punctured both lungs and um so they put me in a, a coma for I think, it was, I think it was about a week 10 days um and i think it was twice in that that they said you know he he might not pull out of it but um anyway we did thank god i came back riding i rode for about three or four months after rode rode quite a few winners but never felt the same i say the bottle was still there but i used to be when i'd pull up i suppose because i lost I lost capacity in my lungs. Um, I so sort of every time I'd pull up, I I I'd nearly be physically sick, and um, and I just felt that I couldn't get as fit as I was. Because I'd like to say all my career I could push a horse for three and a half miles, no problem, and I had to do it because there was quite a few bad ones in the time. But um, I just I just you know, and then and then I Bob Buckler was sort of my main yard at the time, and. Um, I said to Bob one day on a on a Monday, I said, look, I said, I think I'm going to pack up the end of the week. So um, I made Friday at Hereford as uh, my last day riding. So Bob sort of filled the box up and took a load there. Um, and we didn't get a win at a couple of seconds and thirds and that. So, um, yeah, so that day I sort of, I walked away from it. I just still loved riding horses, but in a way I knew I wouldn't, you know, after, after racing, I'd come in home I think my rib cage still, still hurt me because actually they, when when I got that fall and did all the ribs, they actually gave me an X-ray of the ribs and said, look, if you ever get a fall again, take it to the hospital, because any time after that 
and I did get a few falls and ended up in hospital in the three months that I was riding after. And every time I fell, it it was it was hurting. And I remember going to hospital twice, and I remember they just came out and they went, "Don't move." And I went, "Why is that? Have you seen your rib cat?" And I said, "That's from another fall." So, um, but you know, I just kept every now and again. I think the bones got weak, and my the way the rib cage was that every time I got a fall, I probably cracked another one. And then you just kept riding all the time. You put up with the pain, but in the end, it was so it was easy to walk away that way. And then I'd sort of, I'd started getting the yard ready to 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 train anyway. You know, yeah. weight wise, never the problem. No, and you know, because even when I, when I rode in Japan, I had to do nine four over there, and you have to do nine four. You can't do a pound over, and so I was able to do that after a quick sweat. And when I won the Galway plate for Hobbs, he had nine stone seven Amla. And I did that on a decent saddle on him, you know. So I was actually, I was always very light. The one they always had was bottled, and the one they always did was I'd give a horse a ride. And I never turned a ride down in my life. And, um, I mean, even the last week that I was riding, and I knew that I was packing up, I remember going to Hexham, which was like five hours for me for one ride in the cellar. And my last winner was at Kelso, which was probably one of the other, the other side of the country, on the Monday that I was packing up. And I went up there for one ride, for Peter Beaumont, but luckily enough, I I picked up a spare for Martin Todd Hunter and it won, so that was my last winner. Um, but you just say over the years, and I was probably one of the first jockeys to regularly go up the north to ride on days there was no racing down the south. You know, but there I met, you know picked up a spare ride for Peter Beaumont, sort of two years before I I packed up riding and you know, rode Young Kenny to win the, you know, like I won two Scottish nationals. Um, yeah, I rode one for him on Young Kenny with 12 stone won the Peter Marsh chase on him I won two Midlands Nationals one for Eugene O'Sullivan um, and one for uh, and then Young Kenny again that year you know so just yeah been, yeah I never won Champion Hurls of that yeah I was lucky enough to ride the, the, the bumper winner at Cheltenham on um, on um, uh, Monsignor you know, and then he went hurling the next year, which probably the one thing that really pissed me off because I'd been doing all the schooling on him. I came back from an injury the week before he was running his first hurdle and then whether it was the trainer or the owner, but they were blaming one another and said they didn't want me to ride it. So and Norman Williamson rode him. They said I could ride him the next time. And anyway, Norman stayed on him and he ended up winning. He was unbeaten. He won the Tallworth and everything. And that probably was a bit of a kick in the teeth. But that, was, that would have been my sort of third last season riding I'd say you know but that was probably the one the one regret that I actually didn't stay on him and um, you know I sort of I'd worked my way back from 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 an injury to get back to ride him and you know I'd ridden a couple of winners that week and up till the morning before 10 o'clock I was still I was jocked up to ride him and then the trainer rang me and said the owner didn't want me so I did one day I never did but I rang the owner then and he said oh the trainer didn't want you so the usual and anyway I didn't ride him and that was it so but he was a he could have been anything you know you know I still say he was good and he was unbeaten well he no he got beat before I rode him he got beaten his bumper at Newbury and then I rode him at Cheltenham and uh, <clears throat> I still say that um, Sir Blake was a better horse than him he was he was he was the real deal, I'll tell you, he was. I trained 648 winners in total over the 19 years and never had top, top class horses, but it's, it's a lot of winners. I started off with four horses and, um, you know, you, you ring up owners that you rode for, etc. you're in contact with them, but I think a lot of them, they wanted to see if you could actually train horses first before they send you some. So, um, look, a few people, um, a guy called Les Gilbert, and he's still got a horse now, Chris Gordon. He lived near the yard. I'd never never met the man before in my life. I'd seen his colours a few times on the track when I was riding, but didn't know him. He came up to the yard and he said, yeah, he lived 10 minutes away. He said, would you buy me a horse? So I bought him a horse from Martin Lynch over here in Ireland called My Galliano. And he'd ran a few times for Martin, and Martin said he'll win your races. And he was actually my first winner. Uh, he won a conditional jockey's hurdle at Kempton. Um, Liam Cochran rode him. So uh, that was, I'd, I'd been training about three, three months at the time. And actually, go back to the first runner I had was a little filly, I can't think of her name, at um, 
Newton Abbott because I loved the West Country scene. So I thought I'd have my first runner there. And that was actually owned by Ted Walsh. And I'd bought a horse off Ted for an owner. He was one of the horses in the yard. And Ted said, ah, look, I didn't, I, I knew Ted. He'd interviewed me a few times and what have you. And, um, yeah, I'd known him from over the years, I suppose. But he, I bought this horse off him and he said, I'm sending you a mare. He said, I can't get into a race here in Ireland. He said, train her, see if you can win a bad race or a seller with her. So she was my first runner. And uh, she finished second at Newton Abbott. So I think when Mike Galliano won that day, I'd probably had... I'd probably had about 14 or 15 runners. And um, when he won that day, just like the, it was just, I suppose, sheer relief more than anything else and pleasure and everything. And uh, um, I never drank alcohol in my life, but I actually felt like getting drunk that night, but I didn't. But it was, no, it was just great to have a winner. And, uh, and he won. And then, yeah, lucky enough from there on, it started picking up. And um, when you train the winner, a few people send you horses and, um yeah so we, you know we built up a good number after then yeah i started getting a few good horses and a few nice horses and we had winners um without looking at it but i suppose we trained sort of 20 odd winners and then i think my best was uh was about 50 58 or something um and i suppose at one time i had the best part of 90 horses um i moved from winchester after seven years because it wasn't big enough and it wasn't mine, I just sort of was renting it and I had for the season before I temporary stables and so I, I sort of moved to Lamborn with sort of eighty five, ninety horses and um I rented Brian Me Brian was Brian Mean was always a good friend of mine and I I rented Brian's yard off which was a very successful yard and uh, quite a compact yard but beautiful yard, was always lucky. And um so I had that so we we filled that up, you know, and um yeah, I ended up with some nice horses there, and I suppose the best jumper I trained was a horse that probably no, not many people would have heard. A horse called Colonel Frank, and he he couldn't win. I couldn't win a bumper with him. Uh, he was he was sort of a homebred, and he was owned by great sort of hunting people from down in Winchester. But he he placed a couple of bumpers, won two hurdles, three hurdles, and uh, sent him chasing, and um, he he just turned the corner he, he got to a rate in about 150 odd and i ran him in the racing post chase as a as a novice um he'd won at sandown and fontwell and um at newbury and he he went he went off favor for the racing post chase and he slipped up at the second last and and fractured his hock we saved him but he he never ran after you know but he i think he could have been he was being talked about as a gold cup horse you know and i used to ride him out every day he was an absolute machine of a horse to ride. I started training a few flat horses then, and uh, I remember thinking, uh, I claimed a few horses off the flat and thinking, God, I'm going to have these so fit now that um, the flat trainers won't know what hit them. Jeez, everything I ran, the flat finish tailed off. And I remember Kieran Fallon came down the road out for me one morning, and he sat me down at the table and he went, um, he said, oh, you, know, you won't make a flat trainer. And I said, why? He said, you're doing too much of them. And I said, what do you mean? He said, he said, you're basically, you're just, you're just, you're gunning them all the time. He said, you've got them too fit. He said, you've got to freshen them up. And it was just listen to Kieran that time. And because he, he was riding a lot of them. And uh, anyway, I backed off them for a little bit and then started having a few winners on the flat. And then the numbers built up on the flat a, a nice bit. And uh, yeah, touch wood, we had some, we, we, we had a few real nice handicappers on the flat. And then I, I claimed a couple um, a little horse called Who's Winning. Chris Dwyer was training him in Newmarket and he'd had one run and finished third somewhere. He was in a claimer at Warwick and I, I sort of, I remember ringing Chris and saying, look, do you, can this horse be claimed or whatever? He said, look, the owner owes me money. So I claimed him. I think he won me about 12 or 13, you know, decent handicaps on the flat. I had another real good horse that was third in the Wokingham um, called Pickup Sticks. But he was a good horse over with Nick Shannon before, but he won me some good races. Um, and then I sort of bought a couple of two-year-olds and probably the first season of Dark Angel, uh, two-year-olds, I bought one. Um, it was actually Bobby O'Ryan said to me, he said, there's a horse here, he said, but I know it's as green as grass. He said, because I think Kevin had it for the breeze, but he only had it about three weeks. And I bought him, he was actually the slowest breeze of the day at Kempton. So I just thought, oh, will he make a jumper or something if not? And um, 
I didn't even know what Dark Angel was. You know what I mean? It was, you know, he, Dark Angel wasn't a superstar racehorse, and this was his first crop. So I bought him, and he ended up to be a horse called Dark Emerald, who won two for me in Maidan, second in Group Twos, Group Threes, and had a rating of one hundred and fourteen. Uh, and so he was, he was a, he was a, an absolute star of horse. He's still alive, and um, he. Uh, yeah, look, he he took me to to Dubai, which I'd never been to before, and I spent three years in Dubai with horses there, and had a lot of place horses, and um, yeah, just very lucky. Now, I think a lot of people started the the they say the Martin Pipe way of interval training, and I remember actually going back to Captain Foster, who I rode for for years, who was like a just just a great trainer, and I remember when when Martin Pipe started off and. I was riding a bit for the captain and the captain went, um, I'm going to go down to this drain pipes and see what he does with these horses. So he went down to Parley one morning, he had a house down there, asked Martin could he come and Martin went, yeah, of course you can, of course you can. And he went up the gallops and um, the captain saw the horse, they came up three times and uh, apparently Martin, I remember um, the captain telling me and he said, he said, Martin said to me, well, what do you think? And he went, my dear man, he said, I've been doing that for the last 30 years, he said. My horse is coming up the gallops like that. And apparently Pipey turned around to him and said, but do you know what you're looking for at the top of the gallop? Yes, to see if they're fit. And uh, But like I suppose, you know, the captain, the way he did it was the way he did it. It was probably two long canters, but, you know, Martin's way of just this interval training and quick, quick and heartbeat, mm. sort of keeping the heartbeat going back down. And um, so, and then I suppose everybody decided this was the way of training horses after but you know going back to the time of Jenny Pittman when I was there with Jenny and um, and Les Kennard they literally trained horses you know over long distances and Jenny would gallop her horses around the bowl in Lambourne three or four times and uh, and then like the national horses for weeks before she'd build up their stamina of going like two and a half three miles and but then you had Michael Dickinson, who apparently, you know, he galloped his horses three or four miles in the morning, steady away, steady away. So, um, you know, I, I don't think there's any way of training horses. Just you do it your own way and that's it. And, you know, I've been lucky enough. I've been to sort of Gordon Elliott's and while I was still training. And, uh, you know, I think it was after he won the national with um, Tiger Roll the first time. And I remember coming over a couple of days later to... And I stayed with him and, and went to his place and I watched his horses on a Monday morning going two or three times around this round gallop and then up the hill on that deep sand. And I remember going back to the airport and I ring in Brendan, my son, and I said, you, we better start galloping these horses. I said, because these horses here. I said, that was an easy Monday morning. I said, geez, I said, mine wouldn't do it on a work day, you know. But it's just a different way of training horses. And, you know, then the way I see Joseph training horses now, you know, he's trained every decent winner flat and jumping that you can think of um, and he's just got that one uphill gallop um, and then you go to Willie Mullins who does it his way so um, just everybody's got a completely different way and I think Philip Hobbs was the one because I'd, I'd ridden a lot for Philip um, towards the end and um, I was lucky enough actually to, to the one race everybody wants to win is a Galway plate and uh, I, I, I won that before I retired for Philip on Amla and he was the first English train winner of it and um, but I rang Philip up when I started training and I said look I've got four horses here they come in from a field what the hell do I do with them you know what I mean it was different because I just literally come from riding and he just went he said just feed them well and keep, he said he said do whatever work you feel they need he said and keep them fit and so you work out your own thing after a while and sometimes by mistakes and I, you know, I've been so many yards over the years, and as I said, if you saw how Les Kennard trained his horses, like you just wouldn't believe it. And they literally, if the ground was hard, they galloped on hard grass up hills and down hills. And Bob Buckler was the same. Bob just had a massive big place down in Dorset, and like you know, as you're out cantering horses, you'd be jumping posts and rail fences and hedges, and so everybody does it different. The first seven years, I had, I started training. I um, I used to ride out like four or five lots a day and I was doing all the school and the whole lot and then I woke up one morning and had a massive heart attack and um, yeah just literally I was as fit as a butcher's dog and um, I woke up at two o'clock one morning like 
gasping for breath. And anyway, an ambulance came and flipping had stents put in, but I had a massive heart attack. But then not knowing that all my life I had a hole in my heart and a thing called a first degree heart block. So, I mean, touch wood now for the last 12 years has been, been good as gold, you know. But um, yeah, that was, and that was being as fit as I was, you know. And I've never drank and just, you know, I'd always say I'd eat the right foods and that. So, but it's just, it's something that was there that we didn't know that was, that, that I had, you know. So, um, yeah, I thought I was a goner that time, all right. Lying there, sort of sweating, just couldn't move my arms or anything with this pain in my chest, which was like horrific. And next thing I remember an ambulance man or a paramedic looking up where I was living then was about 10 minutes from Swindon Hospital. The guy came out on a motorbike and all I heard him saying was, yeah, this, this, this gentleman's had a massive heart attack. Uh, you know, and I heard him saying, ambulance is two minutes away. And then I was thinking, you know, just lying there thinking, is this actually me? And I actually thought I was dreaming. And I, wasn't, because I, I never have dreams and I don't remember dreams, but actually I remember thinking I was dreaming, but I wasn't. So, um, but touch wood's all good now. Yeah. Yeah, but that was back in, that was 2000 and, I think that was 2008 or nine or something, yeah. Yeah. So, it's all right for the amount of people who told me all the, over the years I didn't have a heart. I proved to them that I did. <laughs> there's, there's a few said that to me. I'm one of those that I just think, look, the day that, that when, you're, when your time's up, your time's up and you can do nothing about it. But look, if, as I said to you, if I, if I keeled over tomorrow, I'd say I've had a great life. I've met some great people. Hope to meet more, but we'll see. <laughs> and not because of a friend, but I'd say one of the, one of the strongest I've ever seen was, was Adrian Maguire. And Adrian was just, he was just unbelievable on a horse. Horses travelled from, he was, he, he was probably the most natural, I'd say, I've ever seen on a horse. Um, but I, I was lucky over the years, it was good. You know, Mark Dwyer again, what a, what a brilliant jockey Mark was. And, uh, you know, Locke and Wire and people like that. Graham Bradley, just a, you know, just brilliant horse man. And, um, yeah, and even up to now, there's I mean, some some great lads riding now, and then AP, and lucky enough, AP, I actually did, there was a there was a book done on him there not long ago, or a, sort of an album with all his winners and that in it, and I was lucky, I was like his six, he wrote his six most winners for me, AP did, and um, but he was just every time I put him on a horse. Yeah, I think him and Adrian were the two that I put on, I put on horses and wouldn't worry because you knew whatever they did was the right thing, you know. And on the flat, riding for me, I'd say the two I did was Richard Quinn and Seb Sanders. You put them on horses and I just would never worry. They were, they were, just, they were just great, you know. They were, they'd ride for you, you know what I mean? So, um, three or four years before I packed up, or even five years, I probably got so big that I tried to do everything on my own. And... Um, Look, I, I trained for some trainers right up to, you know, from the day I started training. I had eight or nine owners that I trained for the whole time, right, for the 19 years, and they were there at the last day. And looking enough, that I had, I had um, you know, JP for, you know, train, train for him for 10 or 11 years, training 35, 38 winners. Um, you know, Les Gilbert, who I trained my first winner for till the end. But I probably lost, I got a lot of, I got a lot of new owners come in and a few syndicates and that and you probably try and do everything on your own and then you know yeah over the years there was a few people that you didn't keep in contact with as much as you should do and you'd lose a few horses and um I think the the year that I had the real good winner with the 50 odd winners there were a lot of them there were horses that I'd probably I'd have bought from other people that had lost form or didn't have form and I ended up you know doing okay with them and then everybody sent me every type of horse and you know you would so then you just take anything to train and then the sort of the, there was a financial crash and I probably got left with I'd say about 14 horses that weren't being paid for and People said, I'll just go and turn them out in the field. But when I was in Lambourne and like I had one little field there, you can't turn 12 or 15 horses out there, so you're feeding them. So you end up losing money. And 
Um, and it just in the end, I, yeah, I suppose, I suppose I got down to twenty five horses, and I sort of looked and see what I had, and and I probably Dark Emerald is sort of finished, and those sort of horses, and they were probably sort of my highest rate. It was a hundred over jumps and sixty five on the flat, and you just think, God, this, you know, this is not sustainable. So, um, so I thought I'd, 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 I'd I thought then it was time that I sort of pack up when the license ran out at the end of that season. And um, it was funny because I'd, I'd actually come over here for a holiday for two days. Every now and again, Adrian Maguire is a good friend. So if I had a, a, a sort of weekend without runners for three days and I wanted to get away, probably it happened once every six months, but I'd get in a car and drive over and go to stay with Adrian for two nights and we'd just talk about the old times. And I was driving past here and I remember seeing a sign for Pilltown. I thought, geez, that's where Joe's for Brian trains. And he'd 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 only started training, I think, the year before. And I remember Adrian was gonna be was out all day and he said he wouldn't be back till three in the afternoon. So I was past at about nine o'clock. And I remember picking the phone up and ringing Joseph's office and and I'd never actually met Joseph before. I'd obviously seen him ride and everything. And um I just rang and I said to the office, so who I was and said, would it be possible Peter Joseph? So and Joseph, he just literally spoke to me straight away. And I said, look, I'm on the road down here. I said, I think I'm about three or four miles from you. Could I come and have a look? And he went, no problem. So up he ca- I came and he took me up the gallops and um, for like two or three lots and was just amazed when I saw the place, you know. And um, anyway, I came back about, I'd say about two months later, same thing, but I rang him the day before, said him over, can I come and have a look? And then he said to me that he was, um, I said to him then about me packing up and he said, what would you do? And I said, well, I don't really know because I honestly didn't know. And then he um, he said, oh, he said, I'd, I'd probably be looking for somebody. What do you like doing? I said, go and race. Anyway, it worked out that I ended up here. So I've been here now for just over four years. Well, it's great to see Joseph's yard sort of building up like it is. And I mean, crikey, when you see in, I think it's, was it, six and a half, seven years been training now, the success he's had over a thousand winners, over a hundred group enlisted winners. And it's just great to see the, the younger horses coming on and being part of all that, you know, but um, it's, uh, look, look, I, I'm a very small part of it. And, you know, Mark Power and Fazel, and they're the two lads who run it up there with Joseph and the lads who run the barns. And, you know, he's got some great work riders and everything here. So, um, but look, you know, my, mine is the racing side of it. And, uh, Look, I, you know, I'm enjoying doing that, what I'm doing now. So um, hopefully it keeps, it lasts, you know. Look, I was born here. I love it. I love the people. Um, you know, you see the same people racing every day here. So friendly. Everybody's good. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult at times because the kids are back in England. Um, and look, you know, planes and everything are great. And, and my daughter's in Newmarket and, uh, you know, she... She rode nearly 40 winners on the flat and she she rode very well and Brendan's doing well. So I see him on the telly every day. And, but there's just times you'd, you'd like to go back for a, for a week or two and spend time with them, which which I've been lucky enough I've done for a few days now and again, you know. So, um, But look, I'm, you know, we're settled in here now and, 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 and I'm enjoying it, you know. The two kids were born the same day, two years apart. So they actually both rode in the same amateur race at Lingfield, Two days after their birthday on the twenty, the birthday is twenty sixth of um, January. So I think it was like the twenty eighth and the 29th or something. It was a mile and a half amateur race. So uh, the license is sorted out that they rode in those. So uh, Brendan got beat a short head in the first one, and I think Jenny finished fourth or something. And um, but it was great to see their careers, and great to see Brendan's now. He had a few quiet years, but. You know, getting base with the Tizards again is, is lovely and I never miss a race of his. Um, I set my alarm every morning for each race, so um, I don't think I've hardly ever missed a winner of his and it's great to see him do as well as he is. And it was great to see Jenny. She rode nearly 40 winners in three seasons on the flat and then she sort of, she, she thought she'd have, a, have enough of it then. So she's secretary now for Ben Brookhouse in, uh, in Newmarket. So... Um, yeah, look, they're both they're both good and they're both settled, so that's great. I think I'd have probably worked on the stud farms, and because um, I used to enjoy it, I used to do a lot of you know when I was like 
12, 13, 14. My dad used to send me down there like at mid 12 o'clock at night time and I used to fall mares and the whole lot. So, and I actually enjoyed the stud side of it a lot. Um, so I, it, it would have to have been something with horses because there was nothing else I could really do. Um, but I, I, I think I'd, I'd have ended up working on stud farms. I suppose you work hard all your life and then you just sort of, um, and people say, oh yeah, well I worked hard to, to get to where I, yeah, you do. But without racing, like some of the things I've done in my life and the people I've met that I would never have, you know, when I retired, I was just so lucky that a couple of months after I retired, I got a, a, a written letter from postcard from Peter O'Sullivan. And uh, he said to me, I'm having a lunch in the Lily Langtree rooms and uh, hotel in London on Monday or whatever it is. And I'd love you to be a guest. So I was thinking, got some big lunch. And there was 10 of us there. And the Queen Mother, she just had her 100th birthday, was one of them. And he had this lunch once a year with her. So he invited me to that. And I was there with Vincent O'Brien, Lester Piggott, uh, Mark Prescott, Peter O'Sullivan, the Queen Mother, Ted Walsh, and the editor from the Times in London. And I just sat there like for for an hour and a half and we all got sort of 10 minutes to to talk to the Queen Mother. And um, just, but things like that, I've just been so lucky that I've been able to do in my life. And yeah, like the Princess Anne, I mean, I, I sort of used to sort of teach her I used to ride out for David Nicholson and ride sort of second jockey to him at one time. So, you know, riding out with Princess Anne and then Prince Charles, because I rode for Nick Gaisley a lot over the years. So sort of, you know, helping them with the schooling and stuff like that. So you just, it's just, you know, just been so lucky that the people you've met and, and if I hadn't got into racing, just never would have met those sort of people. And I know you're saying it's all royals, but they're just, they are people that, um, you know, you've, you've just met and you've had something to do with them all your life and, um, but you know, but but you know, and whether it is from from lads in the yard to, you know, I I just feel that every yard I've gone into, I've gone on well with lads, and some of them are still good friends of mine from over the years. And I know if I go back to England now and I get to, if I go racing for a day, the amount of them that can still come up to me from other yards, and you can sit down and have a chat with them, and so it's been great. Just met some fantastic people.